Thanks for coming. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, today's Athenaeum speaker, uh, Dr. John Warren, who is a professor of biology at the University of Rochester. Uh, just a few things about uh, Dr. Warren. Uh, he did his undergraduate at the University of Virginia, uh, and he then went and did a PhD at the University of Utah, and he studied the theory of sex ratio evolution. Uh, and then uh, he, in 1986, he joined the faculty at the University of Rochester in, in upstate New York. And that's when he made a transition from being a theoretician to actually wanting to test some of the ideas that he had about sex ratio and the uh, forces that drive sex ratio dynamics. Uh, he decided to, to put that to the test in a, a really unique organism called Nasonia, which is a little parasitic wasp that has some interesting sex ratio dynamics. And that's when he got interested in, in symbiosis because he realized that, that there were certain cellular microbes that live in, in Nasonia and other insects that can manipulate the reproduction of these organisms uh, to skew the sex ratios to benefit the microorganisms. And I understand that's what he's going to talk some about today. Uh, he's won uh, some awards like the Humboldt Prize. Uh, he's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, so thanks, Jack. Well, thank you, Patrick. Now, let's see. Uh, can you hear me if I'm over here, too? Can you hear me in the back? Because I tend to wander. <coughs> Speak louder? OK, good. I tend, to <coughs> I tend to wander a little bit when I talk. I kind of don't want to be tethered to the microphone. So uh, yes, today I'm going to tell you about uh, some amazing uh, microorganisms. And I want to start, uh, uh, which we like to refer to as influential passengers, because in a sense, they're along for the ride. Ah, perfect, thanks. In a sense, they're uh, along for the ride. Uh, in their host, but uh, in many cases they manipulate the host in some uh, uh, amazing ways. And so we're going to get into that. Uh, I would like to start out with this uh, concept of symbiosis. I think we all have heard the term symbiosis. And what we usually think that means is mutually beneficial organisms that are mutually beneficial for each other. Some of you who are uh, science fiction fans will probably remember the symbiotic uh, host, uh, you know, in alien races and science fiction stories and things like this. But in a, it, it, the term symbiosis in biology is used a bit more broadly. And it just comes from the meanings of the word sim together, bios life. So symbiotic organisms are organisms that live intimately in association with each other. And they can range from a pathogens. Uh, the viruses that induce uh, uh, colds or the bacteria that uh, might give you an infection to what we call commensals or just microbes that are associated with hosts but aren't necessarily helping them to truly beneficial microbes. So it spans that whole spectrum. And as we've learned, uh, many microorganisms can shift along that spectrum, can be beneficial under some circumstances and then can actually be pathogenic uh, under others. So. By the, that's just a little bit of a backdrop. And what I want to do now is sort of tell you a little personal story about how I got into this uh, area. So when I was a young uh, assistant professor uh, in 1986, right, a long time ago, and uh, I was uh, looking at these little insects that Patrick mentioned, and we were looking in the eggs of the insects. Um, because we wanted to look at the chromosomes. There's some weird chromosome behavior. And in the eggs, we noticed that there were these dots in the egg, a little bit like in this picture. This isn't actually uh, the organism I was looking at, but the same thing. You can see there are these dots in the eggs. We're going, what in the world are those dots doing there in the egg? And uh, so uh, we realized that a previous worker had uh, thought that there was this kind of effect uh, in the wasp that might be attributable to a bacteria. And we had just discovered a couple of closely related new species. So we had this idea that maybe those were bacteria. So we treated the insects with antibiotics, and the dots went away. So bacteria that actually in the egg of the insect 
and therefore get passed on from one generation to the next when the animal reproduces. And normally in those insects, when we cross between them, you couldn't get hybrids. So they would mate with each other, but you wouldn't get any hybrid offspring. But when we got rid of the bacteria, suddenly you could get hybrid offspring. So this is pretty amazing. Maybe the bacteria are playing an important role in preventing the species from mixing and therefore keeping them apart and allowing them to diverge. So that was well, one part that got me excited about this area. But really the story started a little bit earlier because when I was an undergraduate, like many of you, uh, it was near the, uh, en near the end of the Vietnam era. And I was in a program called ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Pro uh, uh, Corps. And uh, at the, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I had a military obligation. I, I had to go in for four years into the Army. But this was at a time when the Vietnam War was almost over, and the Army had a glut of officers, so I applied and said, on my own coin, can I go to graduate school first and then come in? And they said, yeah, sure, you know, we've got too many officers anyway. So I went in to the Army, and the Army, in its great wisdom, decided that I was going to be a bacteriologist. Now, at that time, I'd never taken a course in bacteriology. I was, uh, did genetics, but I didn't know diddly about bacteria, but uh, the Army decided that was going to be my area of expertise. They said, well, you got a PhD in biology? Okay, you're going to do bacteriology. And so I went into the Army, into Europe, to uh, look at the bacteria that are in water to test for water quality. So I had a crash course in learning microbiology very, very quickly. And just by one of these odd happenstances, at the same time, I and some of my colleagues were discovering these insects had bacteria, and these bacteria were doing really weird things to the sex lives of these insects. So sometimes just things come together, and when I finished uh, my army uh, period, I had the obligatory year of unemployment, and then I uh, managed to get a postdoc, and then from there I ended up in Rochester, and I've been there ever since. By the way, I was just talking to my wife last night, and we have five feet of snow on the ground in Rochester. So, Enjoy yourselves. So that's just by way of a little uh, introduction, but also I'd like to give you sort of a flavor of how this revolution that's taking place in microbiology came about. I'm sure you all are hearing about microbiomes all the time. You probably saw in the news just the other day, a lady had a serious intestinal disorder. They did a microbial transplant with her by feeding her cleaned up fecal material. And oftentimes these uh, serious diseases like Crohn's disease will go away. But just in the news just two days ago, uh, the lady uh, received her fecal implant from uh, somebody who had an obesity problem. And then she began to gain weight very, very quickly. So there's growing evidence that the microbes in your guts can play a role in how easy it is for you to either gain or lose weight. So there is, this is happening all the day, you see it in the news. But we can attribute all of this revolution that's going on now pretty much to three scientists, but in particular to this man, Carl Rose. So Carl Rose, uh, and I love this quote, I want to uh, read it to you. So he was a, uh, a microbiologist slash uh, biochemist. And in the 60s, he became very interested in how you could identify different bacteria. So his quote here is, the cell is basically a, an historical document, and gaining the capacity to read it by sequencing the genes cannot but drastically alter the way we look at biology. So he recognized that this, in the cells, there were documents of their prior history. And the book he decided to, re, uh, to read was in this sp specialized organelle within cells uh, called the ribosome. The ribosome is used basically to translate uh, indirectly the sequence from DNA to message and then to proteins. And there are a lot of copies of the ribosome in every cell, in all of our cells and the cells of every organism. And a part of that is made up of uh, RNA which is a sister molecule to DNA, and you can sequence the uh, order of uh, that uh, molecule. And so he chose the ribosomal sequence, and he chose it, it turns out to be a very good one if you want to read the history of life. 
because if we go here, you can see here we've got sort of a secondary structure. There are parts of that molecule that change very quickly. And that means that by comparing that molecule to closely related organisms, you can determine what their relationships are based on what's the same and what's changed. Other parts of that molecule change very, very slowly over time. And as a result, those ones you can use to determine deeper relationships because they change less quickly. So what Carl uh, Rose, this was long before you had uh, easy ways of sequencing DNA or RNA, he painstakingly would extract these uh, ribosomes. He would cut them into pieces and then run them on uh, 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 electrophoretic gels to determine their sequence by how they ran. Very, very painstaking and hard work. So one of the main things that he discovered when he was doing this is he completely restructured our view of the history of life by identifying that within what we used to call the bacteria, there were really two deep branches, one of which were bacteria, the other which are now called archaea. So the very structure of life, so we would have the bacteria here, the, what he recognized as the archaea, and then the eukarya, which includes yeast, animals, plants, algae, things like that. And so he completely restructured our view of life and ran into a lot of resistance. People were not too happy about this. But more important than this is he provided the tool for which we could identify microbes even if we couldn't grow them on a plate. The vast majority of microbes you cannot grow uh, easily on a plate. And they're so uh, they were hidden from scientists until uh, Carl Rose uh, developed a method for being able to identify these microbes. And, but it required another uh, breakthrough, and that was developed by uh, Kerry Mullis. Uh, Kerry Mullis uh, played a very important role in developing a method called polymerase chain reaction which was basically a way that you, and many of you are probably familiar with this, uh, where you can, from a sample containing very complex DNA, you can amplify up a single sequence, a single target sequence. I'm not going to go into the me mechanism, but I just want to point out that has created a huge revolution in biology. Uh, oftentimes people jokingly say you can divide biology into pre-PCR, polymerase chain reaction, and post-PCR because of the way it's revolutionizing the field. Every biology lab almost has a, a thermal cycle or a PCR machine in its lab. Now, uh, Mullis could be uh, safely described as a eccentric. Uh, and uh, I, like, he, I like to put this on here because he was a surfer dude as well. So uh, I'm an East Coast person, and when I uh, read about Kerry Mullis, he's what I would imagine a California scientist would be like. Uh, so he had this great insight, which led to the Nobel Prize. Uh, by the way, Carl Wells never got the Nobel Prize, although there's no question that he absolutely deserved it. Uh, but taking these two inventions and putting them together, the ability to amplify up the ribosomal sequence from a bacterial sample, or even just mud or water, and then be able to identify what bacteria are in there, so all these huge numbers of bacteria we didn't know about before now were accessible. Required Carl Rose painstaking work and then required this incredible invention that was uh, uh, largely due to Kerry Mullis. And then there's one other person I want to tell you about because I want to uh, come to this uh, topic which to me is I would say the most amazing thing that's ever been discovered in biology. And uh, so uh, Lynn Margulis uh, was a person who promoted this idea in the 60s and 70s, which I'll tell you about in a second. So basically, let's go back all the way to the early 1900s. And when biologists were looking in the cells of many uh, organisms, they see these structures that looked like they were bacteria. And there was actually an idea that there could be bacteria in the cells of plants, animals, humans. Uh, and then that idea fell out of favor, and it was determined that these were not actually bacteria, but they were uh, these organelles called the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is an essential organelle. It generates energy for the cell. So that idea fell out of favor, and then Lynn Margulis revisited this idea in the 60s and 70s, and uh, partly because it was discovered that uh, the mitochondria have uh, their own DNA. So she promoted the idea 
that the mitochondria actually came from an ancient symbiosis. And so here we have a tree of life, and the uh, uh, part of the tree of life is based on the mitochondria being transferred probably to an ancient archaea that then led to the eukaryotes, which we belong to. So one of, so we are, uh, and the evidence now, by the way, is overwhelming for this. We are, in a sense, the product of an ancient, ancient symbiosis. All of your cells, all the cells of all the plants and animals, complex animals, and yeast as well, have these mitochondria. So you are a, a community. You are not just yourself, but your community of different organisms. And that, when I learned this, this just blew my mind. I think it's just one of the most amazing facts that have come out of science. And now we know also that another ancient symbiosis, which was incredibly important, was a transfer into a proto-algae-like organism of a group of bacteria called the cyanobacteria. So that transfer led to the evolution of chloroplasts. That signature is extremely strong. We can see very clearly in the DNA of a chloroplast the signature of its origins from cyanobacteria. Now, the cyanobacteria, a long, long time ago, about 2.7 billion years ago, developed the ability to uh, utilize sunlight. And that led to uh, the freeing of oxygen, which changed the atmosphere of the planet and caused its own revolution in life. And then secondarily, in the transfer to plants, that's responsible for us being here, the meals we're eating, our very existence is, is uh, based upon plants, obviously, and that's due to a symbiosis as well. So much of the history of life has centrally to it these symbiotic relationships that in some cases evolved into specialized organelles within the cell. This is not just something that happened in the past, it's ongoing as well. Many, many organisms have symbiotic relationships with microbes, bacteria, fungi, ye yeast, things like this. And I'll just give you a couple of examples to give you a flavor for it. So rhizobia are bacteria that associate with nodules and help form nodules in the roots of many plants, particularly legumes. They fix nitrogen and allow these plants to grow in nitrogen-poor soil. So I don't know if you eat soybeans or if you have a peanuts or whatever it might be, uh, you're dependent on this uh, symbiosis. Um, Vibrio and squid is a really cool story because Vibrio, these squids which have light organs that they use for signaling and reproduction and uh, attracting prey, uh, they take up a bacteria, a Vibrio-like bacteria, that then colonizes a specialized organ and then emits light when their cell concentrations get high enough. Here's a really weird story that's come out recently. In certain stink bugs, which are agricultural pests, uh, they, have a, uh, they pick up this group of bacteria called Burkholderia from the environment and they put them, uh, they colonize particular structures in their gut. Now when the Burkholderia are in environments with heavy pesticide use, the little airplane there, the Burkholderia uh, evolve the ability to break down those pesticides. And so when those particular pesticide resistant Burkholderia colonize these structures, then the stink bugs become have greater protection against the pesticide as well. So I've just told you about uh, some examples where uh, organisms pick up microbes from the environment. And then there's uh, these symbiotic, oftentimes mutually beneficial relationships. There's this other category which I alluded to you, and these are microbes that are inherited. So there are whole classes of microbes that routinely get passed on from one generation to the next through the eggs, not through sperm. So that means they have what we call a uniparental inheritance. Female's infected, she passes it on to her sons and daughters, but the sons do not pass it on to the next generation. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So they get passed on through the female line, not through the male line. And some of you may recognize that this is also true for the mitochondria. Mitochondria get passed on through the female line, not through the male line. And that's why you can trace your mitochondria back through your female lineage, but you do not get your mitochondria from your fathers. So some of these associations are truly ancient. 
Uh, this is an aphid, and for those of you who are gardeners, you probably know that aphids are pests in your garden. And work by Nancy Moran and uh, Paul Bauman over the years have, uh, have established that uh, these uh, uh, aphids have an ancient symbiotic relationship. I don't know how easy it is to see here, but this little cloud here is actually the bacteria within their eggs. And by reconstructing the evolutionary history of the insects through DNA sequencing and the evolutionary history of that bacteria, Buchnera, they're able to show that these bacteria have been passed on from mother to offspring with high fidelity for up to approximately 120 million years. So an ancient symbiosis that's been around for a long time. These bacteria provide essential amino acids for the aphids because the aphids feed on plant phloem, which doesn't have a lot of amino acids in them. So it's a mutualistic, beneficial, mutually beneficial arrangement. And as a matter of fact, you might suppose they, it has to be beneficial, right? If, if you're a microbe and you're passed on from each generation through your host, if you harm your host, you're going to harm your own transmission. So microbes that harm the, their host, it seems to be, would not be maintained very long in nature. So they have to be beneficial, or that's what we would uh, suppose. So must these symbionts always be beneficial? And I wouldn't be asking this question if the answer was yes. The answer is actually no. There are circumstances where they can be harmful, and what we call these are reproductive parasites. And why? Because they actually take over the reproductive system of their hosts, and they play games with sex, basically. So let's look at how and why they do this. So we come back to the point of why they would do it. Well, remember, these microbes are passed on through the female lineage, but not through the male lineage. So if the microbe can enhance the number of females, that's going to be advantageous, even if it's harmful to the males. And by the way, when I say this, I'm not implying that these microbes have little brains and they can figure these things out. They don't. Uh, but what happens is a microbe which can increase the number of females compared to a a similar microbe that cannot, well, the one that has a mutation that uh, causes the increase in the number of females, that microbe will end up predominating over successive generations. It's just simply the bind process of natural selection. So here I have this cute little insect. It's a parasitic wasp. She lays her eggs in the eggs of scale insects. This wasp is so small, it would be the dot on a printed page, the period, smaller than that. But within this teeny little insect, you have these bacteria that live within the eggs. Am I fading in and out here? Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. If it's a problem, make a noise, let me know, okay? You're my man. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so here, uh, within their eggs, you have these teeny little bacteria. And in this particular wasp, when she's infected, that bacteria manipulates the behavior of chromosomes in her eggs that uh, cause the eggs to develop without fertilization. So in these wasps, they've completely dispensed with men. No males necessary. And it's due to the bacteria. We antibiotically treat them, then they can make sons. Without uh, the bacteria, they make sons. With the bacteria, they only make daughters. And that's a big plus for the bacteria because now it's transmitted to 100% of the offspring. It's doubled in effect as transmission. So you can see why it would be doing that. So uh, in the early 90s, um, I started working on this problem. I, uh, 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 when I was in the Army, I had found some interesting bacteria that were doing similar sorts of stuff. And we start my, my lab group with Richard Stotthammer and Hans, and then a different group, Scott O'Neill, and then in Italy, Francisco Bondi. We all started going out and looking for these bacteria in several different systems using Carl Rose's method and PCR. And to, much to our surprise, we found in very different insects and, and also other organisms, like roly, uh, poly, uh, roly polies little pill bugs, things like that, we kept finding the same bacteria. 
And that was a big surprise. And this bacteria was doing all sorts of weird things. I mentioned parthenogenesis. Some of them were actually causing male killing. Uh, so, whoops, that's over there. So when a female was infected, she'd lay eggs. If the eggs were a son, the bacteria would kill it. But not if it was a daughter. Some of them were uh, causing uh, sperm egg incompatibility, I'll tell you about, and others were actually turning genetic males into females. So if the mother produced a son, the bacteria turned that male into a female that then could transmit the bacteria. So if the bacteria did have brains, they are very smart. You can see how amazing these adaptations are. So then what we uh, found was the same kind of bacteria was, seemed to be doing this in very, very different organisms. And it's called Wolbachia. It was uh, named after a uh, scientist who uh, was looking for bacteria in insect eggs back in the early 1900s. And uh, so this Wolbachia, we like to call them master manipulators because they are so adept at manipulating uh, cells in, uh, of their host. They live within the cells. Uh, of uh, the uh, insects and other uh, invertebrates in which they occur. They're closely related, relatively speaking, to a group of bacteria called the rickettsia, some of which cause diseases in humans or in horses or other organisms, but most of which also occur in insects. Uh, they might be, and other arthropods. So they might be vectored by a tick or by a mosquito, and, uh, but they're distant relatives of Wolbachia. And this whole group, of bacteria have been living within the cells of other organisms for, for going on 500 million years. So they are very adept at surviving and functioning within the cells of other organisms. So Wolbachia itself, for instance, there's particular little molecular machines in the cell that shuttle molecules around and, and uh, and the Wolbachia have taken advantage of that. They're able to connect themselves to these little machines, and that will move them around. So that's just an example of how they become very, very good at uh, functioning in cells. And as I mentioned, they're doing these different kinds of manipulations. Many of these involve manipulating the chromosomes in their hosts. Sometimes they're also found, I'll come back to this, they can also provide viral defense. So when a host is infected, like an insect, or like a mosquito might be infected with a Wolbachia, it can provide defense against viruses. And I'm going to come back to that because that's a pretty cool story about how that's being used possibly to control some very nasty human diseases. And the last one, which I've saved to last, is something called cytoplasmic incompatibility. This is where the bacteria modify the sperm and modify the egg and cause an incompatibility between the sperm and the egg. So basically, this is something we never could have thought up for ourselves, but uh, the bacteria figured it out. So the basic way it works is if a male is infected with the bacteria, remember, that male cannot pass the bacteria on. For these particular Wolbachia, they modify the sperm by associating proteins with the, the DNA that's bundled up in the sperm. When that sperm, modified sperm enters an egg, the same strain of bacteria has to be in the egg to rescue that. If it rescues that, then you get normal development. But if the, same, if the bacteria is not in the egg, then what happens is the chromosomes uh, from the sperm condense improperly, and that kills the egg. So why in the world would the bacteria be doing this? So an infected male produces sperm that kills the egg of uninfected females. What happens is, in effect, you're reducing the number of uninfected females in that host population. And so the bacteria increases through that means. It's a very backward means, a very sneaky means of increasing in frequency. You increase in frequency because you reduce the fitness of lineages that don't have you, rather than increasing the fitness of lineages that do have you. So these are all the different games that they can play. Um, we now know, through uh, work in my lab and, and several others, that Wolbachia are probably the most abundant parasitic bacteria on the planet. 
Certainly in terrestrial ecosystems they are. And the reason is, so by doing a series of sampling all over the world, we now know that somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of all arthropods are infected with this bacteria. Since arthropods are by far the most abundant animals on the planet, certainly in, uh, again, we're talking about terrestrial systems, that makes these bacteria incredibly common. Millions and millions of species are infected with these guys. So they have an ability not just to be transmitted through the eggs, but they can also jump between species. And that's what allows them to be so incredibly abundant. So uh, again, back in the early 90s, I went on a collecting expedition down to uh, Panama. Uh, and uh, this is my field assistant, my daughter Claire, uh, who's going to get married this August. And uh, Don Windsor, who is a, a fantastic colleague who is at the Smithsonian Institute in Panama. And he, Don is a real tropical biologist. Because real tropical biologists aren't afraid to use an umbrella. You know, they know it rains here in the tropical rainforest. I'm using an umbrella, you know. Whereas the, the folks from other places, you know, they felt that that would look too, too uh, uh, sissified to have an umbrella. But. He was much more sensible. So anyway, we went, and what we, uh, what we found just by sampling in Panama and a couple of other places initially, that 20% of all insect species had Wolbachia. And now for further sampling and doing statistical adjustments, we know it's upwards of 40 to 60%. That's an incredible number. Okay, so what are these guys doing? Why do we care about it, you know? Uh, one uh, reason is, as I mentioned, so here is looking at it uh, from the, uh, looking at this wasp I told you about, this parasitic wasp. Here she is. She's laying her eggs in the fly pupa so they can play a role in keeping fly numbers down. Each of these species, here's a complex of species, each of those species has its own Wolbachia. Not only one, but it has, in many cases, two. In one case, it has three different Wolbachia. All the bacteria being maintained within the eggs. Uh, but, and as I mentioned, when you cross between the species, they can't hybridize normally until you remove the bacteria. So there's a, a controversial idea, but one that's gaining support, that the Wolbachia could be playing a role in allowing new species to evolve, at least uh, under some circumstances. There are many other ways, of course, that new species evolve, but it looks like the Wolbachia may be playing a role. So that's just on a kind of a global sense. Another thing that came uh, to pass is when we were uh, working on Wolbachia with uh, some people at a genome sequencing center, we became uh, uh, interested in the question of whether uh, Wolbachia uh, genes could get into the nucleus of their hosts. And there was a Japanese group who had found an example of this in a beetle, where part of uh, the DNA from the bacteria were in the host. So, uh, there's this interesting uh, side story. When the human genome was first sequenced and the paper came out, it was reported that we have a lot of bacterial genes in our DNA. And then it was shown that that was a mistake, that when you sequence genomes, sometimes pieces of DNA get inserted by mistake during the process. So that was a bit of an embarrassment for the genome centers uh, who were working on that. And it was shown that those were just artifacts. So then th what the genome centers started doing was when they would uh, sequence a genome, they would pull out all the bacterial sequences and throw them out. They throw them into their garbage can, saying, this is just garbage, it's not really relevant to our genome sequence. So when we came along, we thought that if we're going to find bacteria in, in uh, animal genomes, which up to that point people said, no, that doesn't happen, then we would expect to find it in for Wolbachia because it's so closely associated with the nucleus in the germline. Remember, it's got to be in the germline to be passed on to the next generation. So basically, we started looking in the trash cans of genome sequencing projects, and we found that about one-third of all sequenced arthropod genomes showed Wolbachia genes in their genomes. And then we confirmed these by certain methods using that PCR method to say, this is real, this isn't just an artifact. So that was, that's a pretty amazing number. And now it's being found that, um, oh, I'll just point out this one thing. In this one insect, this one fly, we found 
the whole chromosome of Wolbachia inserted into the chromosome of the insect. That's about one million bases of DNA from a bacteria inserted into the chromosomes. So, okay, so who cares? Uh, and there's several reasons why we can start to care. One reason is this, through a process of evolution, when a big chunk of DNA or a chunk of DNA from a bacteria gets inserted into uh, the uh, uh, genome of an animal, most of the time it's just gonna degrade by mutation, but every once in a while a gene can be grabbed by natural selection and evolve into a completely new biochemical capability for that organism. So uh, scientists are now finding this occurs frequently. A lot of insects not only have their own genes, but they've picked up genes through time from uh, bacteria. Wolbachia being the main one, but there are others as well. So if we can, uh, and they, they can sometimes give them unique abilities. For instance, certain leaf-feeding beetles have picked up genes from a bacteria that help them in digesting cellulose. So if we can now target these genes, it could provide a really uh, uh, helpful uh, pest control mechanism, and one which doesn't involve the release of toxic pesticides in the environment. So we could have much more targeted pest control mechanisms. That's all you know, in the future, uh, but it's something that's emerging from this discovery. Um, this is just another example of one of these transfers. In this case, it's a fungal gene that got transferred into aphids that allow it to change color. Um, and so now I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm just gonna talk about some of the applications. So I'm gonna tell you about two applications of this Wolbachia stuff. This being, uh, one has to do with the control of filarial nematodes, and the other has to do with the control of uh, di viral disease in humans that are transmitted by mosquitoes. Now this being lunchtime, I'm not gonna show you pictures of filarial infections, uh, which are very nasty. You know, elephantiasis, river blindness, dog heartworm, many of you probably have your dogs receive heartworm medication, so on and so forth. But it turns out these filarial nematodes are loaded with Wolbachia. But in, in, the, in the worms, it appears to be a beneficial microbe for uh, the worms. So when this was discovered initially by Pippo Bondi, the Italian scientist I mentioned, and that's led to an explosion in the medical field where people are now using antibiotic and antibiotic derivatives as a potential way to control these very nasty diseases. So we don't know how well it's gonna work. There are lots of field trials going on. But you can see how you know, some people working on some obscure topic in science then opens up something and opens up a whole new field for uh, research and possibly health applications. Carl Rose slaving away, reconstructing these uh, sequences uh, led to this revolution in microbiology that allowed us to identify many bacteria, know about the role of microbiome in our own health. All of the, these things show the serendipity of science, that we, can, we can't just say, we're going to discover a cure for cancer. You need all the work that leads up to a better biological understanding that creates the possibility for a cure. So uh, the other one I want to tell you about is uh, using Wolbachia to control uh, dengue. Dengue is a very nasty uh, semi-tropical disease that is spreading uh, into uh, uh, more northerly and southerly areas. Uh, and uh, Scott O'Neill, my colleague, the one who in, in the early days when we were first looking at Wolbachia, he was uh, along with us finding uh, that these bacteria were in many different organisms. And he uh, developed this project, which I'll be honest with you, I didn't think it had much chance of working, and I've been proven wrong. He's done amazing things with this project. So his basic idea, well, initially had one idea, and now it's morphed into this new one because they discovered that Wolbachia will suppress dengue virus. So if the mosquito has Wolbachia, then dengue virus cannot replicate in the mosquito very well, and therefore cannot be transmitted to people very well. Uh, the problem was that the main vector for dengue virus doesn't have Wolbachia. So what do you do? So what he began to do was, through very laborious work, was able to transfer Wolbachia into the mosquito, mosquito Aedes aegypti, 
that, uh, and then was able to show that when he created this strain of mosquitoes, indeed, it, uh, they couldn't transmit dengue very well. Okay, so you're partly there, okay, but you've got a big problem. You've got a strain of mosquitoes in your lab, and there are 100 billion mosquitoes out in nature. How are you going to replace that 100 billion mosquitoes with your lab strain? Sounds like it's impossible. But then what we do is we come to the fact, Wolbachia have a drive. Remember that sperm egg incompatibility I told you about? The Wolbachia he used causes that sperm egg incompatibility. So if you introduce it in a population, it will then begin to increase because the sperm from infected males is killing the eggs of uninfected females. So it has a drive. So here we have this possibility. Can you actually replace the mosquitoes out in nature with a strain which cannot transmit dengue. So now that's, a, that's not only a scientific challenge, that is a sociological challenge as well. So this is just showing the idea of how it will spread. And why is that? Can you imagine going somewhere and saying, hey, I want to control dengue virus. Is it okay with you if I release 100,000 mosquitoes in your neighborhood? That's not, a, it's not an easy sell. Is it? So uh, uh, what uh, Scott did, and uh, it, to me is quite amazing, is, is he went from the university to, uh, he wanted to do an initial field trial in northern Australia. He's Australian. And so he would go to these towns, and he would go through these education series and explain to people how it worked. And the only way this could work is if you could uh, get the public to agree to it. So that's a huge sociological issue, and they accomplished it. And in fact, in uh, this uh, area in northern Australia, they did a test case. They released the uh, infected mosquitoes with Wolbachia. Fortunately, this was not a dengue area, but it was a test case with Wolbachia. And then it very quickly went to near 100%. So that's the proof that it can work in uh, outside, and it stayed there all the way till now. So it's spread, and in principle, uh, dengue uh, would not easily be transmitted now in that area. But what are you going to do? You're going to introduce dengue there and see if it works? Well, that, of course, would not go over very well, and nor would it be a moral thing to do. So what they're now doing, let's see if I have the slide. Oh, I don't have a slide for it. What they're now doing is going to endemic areas in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and again, with, uh, uh, it is important to get uh, the public and the officials to agree to this. They're now doing trials to see whether this would work. Uh, amazing story, really, in my mind. So I'm going to tell you two other things and then wrap up. Uh, we've talked about how microbes manipulate their hosts. But one way that microbes manipulate their hosts a lot is through manipulating the behavior of their hosts. And there are lots of examples of this. I'm going to tell you uh, two of them. And uh, this is the work by Vera Ross in uh, the Netherlands. And she was working on a virus uh, called a baculovirus. It's a virus of uh, butterflies and moths. And many of these are pests, right? But when the uh, virus infects the caterpillar, the caterpillars start to do something they don't normally do. They start to climb up to the top of the tree. They don't normally go there. And once they go there, the virus kills them. By being up at the top of the tree, the virus is disseminated much more efficiently. So the virus has actually manipulated the host to go to a place that is going to better manipulate or better transmit the virus. And they're now on their way to figuring out how that's accomplished. They think it's accomplished by affecting the uh, ability of the caterpillars to orient with respect to light. So again, of course, viruses don't have any brains, but they're manipulating the hosts in ways that will enhance transmission of the virus. You know, this happens to us all the time. You get a cold, what do you do? You sneeze a lot. You transmit that now, I don't think that's just happenstance. I suspect that the irritation that the cold virus creates is actually an adaptation on the part of the cold virus to enhance its transmission. So here's another example. Uh, there is this uh, uh, protozoal microbe called Toxoplasmosa 
It's uh, one reason why uh, uh, pregnant women should not handle uh, kitty litter, because it's a disease that people can get, although it doesn't promote itself in humans, it can cause problems in humans. But its normal transmission pattern is between a predator, like a cat, and mice. So when mice become infected with toxoplasmosis, it causes a change in their behavior. So here we have an infected and uninfected, and they would do, a, do experiments where they would give the mice an opportunity to move towards a cat or move towards a rabbit. And the infected ones lost their fear of cats. So what does this do? This helps complete the cycle from mouse to cat, cat fecal matter, then back to mouse. Again, the people are now trying to figure out how they manipulate this, but this kind of manipulation makes adaptive sense for the microorganism and uh, promotes their transmission. And I'm just going to close by commenting on microbiomes because we're all hearing a lot about them. So this is, again, a tribute to Carl Rose. This whole field emerges from his initial discoveries. Now when people are doing micro, uh, looking for uh, microbial communities, they typically use the PCR methodology, uh, and then uh, they sequence the ribosomal sequences, and then from this you can determine a community of microbes. Microbes that normally could never have been cultured, didn't even know to exist until fairly recently. So we have the lots of human microbiome projects, hospital microbiome studies to get a better feel for how uh, uh, disease agents can move through hospitals. Uh, you can have your own microbiome done. Just go to americangut.com or org or whatever it is. For a reasonable fee, you can have your microbiome done. And one thing you'll learn is if you've got a dog, you and your dog share a lot of your microbiome. So we're exchanging microbiomes with our environment all the time and with the organisms with which we're associated. They even uh, can use microbiomes uh, to determine where you've been. So if you happen to go on a trip to some place and you come back, well, you're going to carry a signature in your poop of where you've been, at least transiently. But I think probably as equally important of that as are these earth microbiome projects. So there's several projects that try to get a much better idea of the diversity of microbes on the whole planet. And this is extremely important because microbes in soil, microbes in the oceans play a, a, a central role in the cycling of nutrients and uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, carbon. So their essential role between life primarily microorganisms, and the geochemical cycles of our planet. So this work is uh, going to be incredibly important for us as a species. So I'll just uh, end with that. Um, I have this slide called Other Worlds, and it's just a, one of the things that I've learned from this is that we live in our own worlds. You know, you're probably sitting here thinking, well, you know, well, what am I going to do this afternoon or wh uh, whatever it might be. We live in our own worlds, and out in nature, the, all these organisms are living in their world as well. And as a biologist, you begin to really develop a sense for this. So, for instance, you take the bluebirds, which I've done a bit of studying of the bluebirds. Within the bluebird nest, there's this fly that attacks the, the, uh, lays eggs, and the fly lays eggs, and those feed on the nestlings. Again, I spare you the graphic picture. Uh, now, this little wasp I told you about, Nasonia, then comes in, lays its eggs, and kills the flies. Within the Nasonia, you have these bacteria, Wolbachia, that are residing in their bodies and their eggs. And then within the Wolbachia, there are bacteria, uh, phages, what are called phages. They're viruses that attack the bacteria. So you have this nested system of interactions. Symbioses, good or bad, just scattered throughout, even in this little system here, and it's just an essential part of life, uh, and I think that's pretty exciting. So I'll just end it there, and let's see if we have any questions.
I, I really appreciated your talk. I'm a retired biologist, uh, biology professor from New England, and um, I had the wonderful opportunity um, back in the 90s of spending about a year in fairly close contact with Lynn Margulis. And she died a couple of years ago, much too young. And um, I would think that your presentation today was a tribute to her insights and advocacies that go way back in terms of promoting the concepts that, first of all, the concept of the individual is a, is a delusion. Uh, all of us are communities, as you pointed out. Uh, in fact, all eukaryotic organisms, even single cellular ones, are symbi uh, symbiotic communities, not just because of the mitochondria and the chloroplast, but uh, because of bacteria and viruses that inhabit them. And my question to you is, what do you think of her um, postulate that she promoted in a few books, one of which is called Symbiotic Planet, that evolution is really a matter of symbiotic relationships undergoing changes uh, more than it is simply the, uh, the genotypes being selected, uh, the primary genotype of the eukaryotic cell being, being undergoing Darwinian selection, but rather there's a whole lot of lateral genetic influences in the form of symbiotic relationships that are really creating these new creatures. Of course, one of the m most striking examples is the 25,000 or so species of, of uh, lichens, which are each one a, a unique combination of fun fungus and alga. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, and as I, as I pointed out, I think that Lynn Margulis uh, made what's probably the most amazing discovery in science, which is uh, that we're derived from these ancient symbiotic relationships. But there are different, uh, there are different ways of looking at uh, a, a, an issue which give you different kinds of insights. So uh, I don't adhere to some of her more extreme views about uh, symbiosis being this, uh, that, that the symbiont is the unit of evolution. Uh, because, uh, uh, but you can gain certain insights from that. But I find that since we now know that, as, as you pointed out, genes can move, micro, microbes can move between hosts and systems. Genes can move, and as a matter of fact, bacteria have pretty fluid genomes where they're picking up genes from other organisms all the time. So in one sense, we can gain a lot of insights by looking at things strictly from the gene view. We gain insights about how, how are genes selected uh, under different environments, but the key is the environment. So the biotic environment, the associated other organisms, the hosts, the other microbes, all of those together influence how selection acts. But I'm not one of these people who uh, has concluded that Darwinism needs to be thrown out. I think that Darwinism is as strong as ever, and it gives you, I'm not saying you are either, but I'm just addressing that one issue. It gives you incredible insight into this process. We wouldn't understand why Wolbachia does what it does unless we took a natural selection view to what it's doing. So I think that we need to consider interacting organisms, that's very important, but we also need to consider how selection acts at the level of genes. Oh yeah, and I think uh, uh, the way I look at it more is the microbial environment is a key part of the environment that influences how selection operates uh, on individual organisms. Um, you know Lynn Margulis much better than I do, but I uh, had uh, several conversations with her about these topics in the past, and um, so yeah, she she uh, definitely thought the whole symbiotic. Uh, unit was the unit of selection. Not that she didn't think natural selection was undergoing. But yeah. Um, I had a, a question. Is Wolbachia uh, 
uh, increasing in the hosts that it it in, infects, if I can use that word. Um, and so are you getting the spread? And what is it special about the mosquito you you had that wasn't infected, but then you had to infect it? Does that uh, make sense? You, you mean? Uh, so, so, so you said that there's a lot of species that are infected with, with right. Wolbachia. Is that number increasing over time? And so are they perpetuating themselves? And mm -hmm. is it there's something special about the mosquito that they had to go in and infect that makes them a little bit more resistant to those infections? Yeah. Um, we don't know if it's increasing over time. Uh, we don't, uh, we'd have to see, we'd <laughs> come back and ask that question in 100,000 years and we'll know because <laughs> it's, it's a global phenomena. So we don't know, we don't have evidence that it's in some kind of dynamic uh, equilibrium. I think basically what can happen is species become infected over a period of time, then the Wolbachia can jump into a new species, but eventually the species gets cured of its Wolbachia, in part through the evolution of resistance. So it's just like a, any other disease, except on a global scale. When a cold virus spreads, it spreads because it infects people, and before you lose the cold, how many people do you transmit it to? If you transmit it to more than one person, then cold epidemic will happen. If you transmit it to less than one person on average, then the cold uh, season will go into decline. So I think the same thing is probably going on with Wolbachia. I just don't know whether it's stable or going up or going down. Uh, the mosquitoes that wasn't infected, Aedes aegypti, has a close relative that is infected. Uh, it, one possibility could be that Aedes aegypti was resistant. Um, I think what Scott found was that it, could, it, can, it can maintain a Wolbachia infection. So that might just be chance that it's one of the 40% that didn't have the bacteria. Uh, I, Jack, I remember when uh, several years back when you, your group made the discovery that Wolbachia genes are inserted in, into the genome. It was, it was a really cool finding. Uh, but I'm just wondering, how do you make the jump from cytoplasmic bacteria to bacteria actually being inserted into the genome uh, of a eukaryote? Could you paint a picture for how that could happen mechanistically? Or No, I didn't do a particularly good job of that. Uh, uh, the, the main thing is that they're in the germ cells. So uh, when an egg's being made, the bacteria are right there. So it could be two things. One is maybe are the bacteria actively putting their genes in? And uh, we don't think so. Uh, basically what happens is, you know, DNA is being damaged all the time. And when uh, DNA, let's say, gets a double strand break or something like that, the cell has mechanisms for repairing that. And one of the mechanisms has to do is, in a sense, searching for a similar piece of DNA to use as a patch to bridge that gap. And uh, so uh, oftentimes a correct, a similar sequence is used as a patch. I like to use the road crew analogy to this, but sometimes it might grab the wrong piece of DNA, particularly if there's a short stretches of similarity on the ends of that DNA break. So this happens all the time, that when DNA gets repaired, it inserts the wrong thing in. And oftentimes, so for instance, in our, gene, in our DNA, we have a lot of pieces of mitochondrial DNA stuck in our genome, and that's because it was used as a patch. And then what happens is it usually just degrades over time, eventually it's lost. And the same thing goes on with Wolbachia. Every once in a while it's grabbed as a patch. And so, but over longer time periods we can see this happening because we can go in and say, oh, here's a gene that the, uh, the beetle's using. Uh, we can see that it's actively transcribed, it makes a protein, and it originally came from Wolbachia. But most of the time, those transfers just degrade. So I think it's just by chance. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Owen Foster. I'm a senior at Pitzer. Uh, a few slides back, you mentioned uh, all the different mechanisms by which Wolbachia secures its transmission through, um, through different generations. Um, and just thinking about uh, how you're talking about different chromosomal rearrangements and the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is now uh, heavily implemented in the biotech industry and potential therapeutics. Have you identified any interesting mechanisms that uh, you've been exploring? You mean for uh, Wolbachia mechanisms? Right, right. So you gave like a, a slew of different 
things in terms of like uh, silencing the potential male cr cells, et cetera? Um, no, I, uh, I haven't personally, but there is the, the examples I showed here where it's possibly going to be used for uh, disease control. And uh, one of the main goals now is to figure out, for instance, how does it feminize, how does the Wolbachia recognize and kill males? Um, how is it uh, stably transmitted from one generation to the next? And those things may uh, lead to discoveries that could be of therapeutic uh, application. But so far, I've, I haven't found any. We still don't quite know even how it, it causes sperm-egg incompatibility. But once that's discovered, you could use Wolbachia as, as a way for sterile male release programs. So one means of controlling pest insects is to release males that are sterile that then knock down pest populations. That's used a lot, for instance, for uh, flies that uh, bite uh, cattle and transmit disease. So sterile male release programs are used a lot. So eventually, I think that will be used. Um, the other thing that people are working hard on is they're trying to figure out how Wolbachia has a drive. And once that's figured out, you find the genes, then those can be, ins the actual genetic mechanism could be inserted into any organism you might want to put it in to then drive a desirable trait. Like for instance, malaria resistance. If you can uh, associate the drive mechanism with resistance to malaria, then you can drive resistance to malaria within a pest population. Those are the ideas that people are thinking about. It's pretty, pretty early stages, but has some possibility. Okay, if there are no other questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Time.